What's up, everybody? I'm Dave Miranda, and this is episode 118 of Just Give Me Five. I hope you guys are doing great. Continue to be amazing. We got a really, really awesome show lined up for you today. But first things first, I need you to hit that like button. I need you to hit that subscribe. And I need you to spread the word about Just Give Me Five. All right. Well, we had to take a little break last week uh, due to some... Uh, some health issues, you know, whatever's been going around. I was, it caught me and I was just down for the count, but I'm feeling a lot better now and we're back in the groove. So if you guys caught episode 117, you saw we had none other than the one and only Buddy White from Intro. And let me tell you, you know, I, I, like I said, man, like Intro was by far, like to, in my personal opinion, they were just one of the most underrated R&B groups of the 90s. Um, Kenny Green, God bless his soul. Um, you know, if he if he hadn't passed, man, you know, I, I like I said, I really believe that he would have been mentioned a lot more, you know, with uh, with the greats as far as especially his his songwriting skills. Um, he would be up there with R. Kelly, you know, a lot of them, man, because he wrote so many hits for a lot of people, man. Mary J. Blige, you know, I mean, I mean, just the, the list goes on. And um, the one thing that really stood out with Buddy, he didn't, he didn't speak about it on our episode, but he did speak about it in another interview that I had seen a while back. And I really thought this was real stand up about him. And honestly, it's what made me reach out to him. Um, two, three months before Kenny Green passed away when he was diagnosed with HIV and was, and was, it was, uh, you know, was dying, um, Buddy actually had him live with him um, and his family for the final three months of his, of his life. And, um, you know, he... They were working on music together, you know, and he said he said it was it was to the point where like Kenny just wanted to just go out doing what he want what he loved doing. So but he was so weak that he couldn't even stand up. So they had to record basically like while he was sitting, like laying down on the couch. Um, and I just thought that was just I was like, man, that's a real ass dude, man. You know, it's just it's like despite w whatever, you know what I'm saying? Like whatever the, the media and the press was saying about Kenny Green's sexuality, whatever. Right. Like. He, that's just a stand-up dude, man. He was like, regardless of whatever, man, you're my brother, um, and I'm going to take care of you, man. You know what I mean? And and everybody else was turning their backs on him. He's one of the guys that just stood by him. And I was like, yo, man, this is, that's a real-ass dude, man. Like, I, I can't help but just respect that guy, man. And um, and he just – I never met Buddy, but you could just tell, man, that just real good energy, man. Just somebody that just, you know, just as real as they come got a good heart you know and very very talented and we were just so honored to have him on the show so make sure you guys watch episode 117 all right but today's guest is one of the ogs of the arizona comedy scene and is a huge staple in the community we're going to talk about his days in comedy as well as his time working in television we're going to talk about a Prince fan group that he made up called the Purple Paisleys of Arizona, some memorable moments, and so much more. So ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, I present to you, Travis Thurman. Hi, my name is Travis Thurman. I'm here in beautiful Arizona, my home state, and all I'm saying is just give me five. When I got out of high school, and by the way, being native and all, I graduated Trevor Brown, 88, what, what? Um, <laughs> people look at me like, you were from Trevor Brown? But right, yeah, right. that's the little west side. I always get that everywhere. <laughs> but I, uh, I, I got out of high school and I wanted to perform and I wanted to, get, I wanted to be an actor. I wanted to uh, pretty much you know, get an agent, but I realized I'm in Arizona, but I was taking little steps in theater and ensemble groups. And then I came across uh, a couple of improv groups in town. I had never done improv before. And I went into there and right, this is like probably 88, 89. And I rolled in and it was a little small place called the Adobe Oven located on 7th Avenue in Bethany. And we would perform every Friday and Saturday night. And we would just have a ball. It was small coffee house, it just, you know, off the cuff comedy and I hadn't even thought about getting on stage doing stand up. Yeah. And as time progressed, um, I ended up uh, going from there to working with uh, a wonderful guy who did so much for the Valley for uh, improvisation, improvisational comedy. Uh, that was Louis Anthony Russo. And he had a spot over in Scottsdale called the Oxymorons. Uh, we, it was almost the same thing I was doing at the Adobe Oven, but it was a packed house. 
family show. And that's where I would spend most of my Friday and Saturdays was just doing improv comedy back and forth, you know, off the cuff stuff is kind of where I got it. And then they had comedy classes on the side okay. that I ended up uh, taking that turned out to be, you know, a, a, a foot in with some of the clubs in town. Now, back in the day, I mean, we used to have a whole, I mean, a, 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 so many comedy clubs from, um, we had, you know, of course, the granddaddy was was the improv, but we had Finney Bones. Uh, there was a comedy club on Northern. I want to say it was the Laughing Spot or the Laugh. It wasn't the Laugh Factory, but um, they were doing open mics off and on. So I would go up there and, and try to do a few off and on and get about three minutes out of it. And didn't really progress until like 2000 hit after taking some comedy classes that I decided to do uh, a comedy show over in... Um, uh, Tempe, across from the Improv, we, it was at a place called Acme Roadhouse. And I walked in, yeah, yeah. awesome joint. And we walked in there, I walked in on a, on, a, on a Sunday night, open stage, three of my friends got up there, right. and we just started riffing, doing jokes, and then it blew up. I mean, we're, we had open mic comics out the door trying to get in because they limited you at the Improv a little bit, right. but as soon as we, they, they started noticing what we were doing, they were letting some of us come over and perform with them a little bit. Nice. And that's what really broke the door down was me opening that show. Yeah. And then more people around town were asking me to come out and perform and, and do that. So that's, that's kind of what got me started in the game was definitely improv comedy going into doing my own open mic, so. Did you always know you had a humorous side? Like as a kid, were you a class clown? Always, <laughs> yeah. always. That's usually how it starts, man. So, I mean, I, I mean, I, if, you, if you were being picked on, then you had to battle it back with some humor. That was yeah, the best absolutely. way I could do it. You used to snap. Yes. Yeah. And then like, the one talent I had in high school was I could do the bell. Like if they had a substitute teacher, they'd go, Travis, go do the bell. And I'd go, boom. And they everyone would get up and leave, and they go, "What was that? That was the bell." And they'd freak the substitute out. Right, right. So, I, I mean, I I used to do impressions back um, in the '80s around my friends. I mean, I'm, I'm talking about I used to do, oh God, Ronald Reagan and uh, Howard Cosell in front of my friends in in like junior high. Okay. Shows you how old I am, but but yeah, I had that sense of humor to 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 branch out and be more social with people that's what helped me out yeah. i loved making people laugh you know i mean it is part of me you know trying to get the center of attention back in the day but man it was always funny to come off and riff with somebody that i was around and uh, yeah I, I i my parents knew it my whole my friends knew it and it's you know it's 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 made me who i am today i'm, I'm, I'm it gives me great social skills Absolutely. to have a little humor in your life so Absolutely, man. Now, who do you think, who do you feel like were some of like the, you know, some, some legends or some that you've had, that you've opened up for, had the share, uh, the privilege of sharing the stage? In my whole universe, I always said I have, I have three people that I, I will bow down to over the years when I was a kid. And I was Robin Williams, Rich Pryor, and Steve Martin. There you go. But as time went on, I started finding comics that were local here that I actually worked with, opened up for David Spade. Um, yeah. Uh, Gary Shandling was uh, a local comic as well too, from Tucson, and uh, Pop. Right, that's right. And yeah. the one I, I'm, I'm a huge, I get a lot of my my style comedy from was Pablo Francisco. Okay. Because I like someone who's got a little bit of goofiness, a lot of sounds, yeah, and music to it. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of my other closest friends that I, I he's, uh, he he used to run laughs in Tucson, but. He's in Albuquerque, but Scotty Goff was a huge, huge mentor of mine okay. here in town. But as time went on, I got to get inside the club and God bless Dan Murr. Dan Murr was the man at the Tempe Improv because if you've seen some of David Spade's specials, Jerry Seinfeld's movie Comedian was shot at the Tempe Improv. He got a lot of us uh, a break to get on stage and perform and open for people. So I got to work with... Uh, Oh man, Robert Schimmel, God rest his soul. Um, uh, Craig Robinson from The Office. Um, and uh, I think my, my favorite uh, was uh, Jim Brewer. Uh, it was just him and I. Uh, they brought him in because he was gonna do a longer set and they had me do a whole feature uh, set to start with. But I've got to work with people 
uh, gosh, you know, it, it goes down where you just have that brief encounter like uh, Ralphie May, Louis Anderson, Kevin Pollack, uh, and yeah, it's, 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 it's awesome to be in this room with people that had such that one, uh, one night stand comedy specials on HBO. HBO, yeah. And you're just, you know, you're just like going, this is cool. And you could have a conversation with them on, on their upbringings and their comedy styles and everything like that. So generous, generous ride working at the Tempe Improv. And then, then definitely I went on to work at uh, Stand Up Live where I got to work with Brad Garrett from Everyone Loves Raymond. Yeah. And, uh, and I actually, during that weekend with Brad Garrett, was a brand new comic by the name of Melissa Villasenor, who was on SNL. She had just got off um, America's Got Talent, so it was yep. us three. Yep. So yeah, it, it's what a ride it, it's been it's to, to perform with these people you know, coming across in town. They've been great. So I haven't parted ways. I'm I, it's just more like I never say never okay. on the whole subject matter of it. A lot of it was I got uh, ill in 2019. Uh, I, I ended up getting ulcerative colitis, and then uh, pandemic happened. Right. So it was a little hard. I wasn't, you know, I didn't know the the, the information of going out and and sharing an, an open mic. I didn't know that as as of yet. And so I I kind of took myself out of the game, and uh, took care of my family. And along with you know, I, I lost uh, my mother during that time too. And right. yeah, and it 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 was never me saying, oh, I'm done with this. Right. But it, there is a time in someone's career that you could step back and you, you're going to have to reinvent and rewrite. And that's, that's, you know, something I'm looking at today. Today's comics, it's so different generation when you see the, the, the real talented, successful ones that are out there doing such a great name. And, and you know, but I'm, I'm more in the old school generation where I can get on stage and talk about 80s and 90s music and... It's at that point now where you say it and, you know, when you talk about boys to men and some of the audience, some of them like will turn their head like, what? Right, right. So, right. yeah, I, I'll never say never on this, this venture of doing stand-up. I, I, you know, I'm, I'm always looking to do an open mic off and on. Yeah. Uh, but, yeah, I, I mean, I'm always going to get on a stage somewhere down the road. What would you say your style was? Were you, were you, were you kind of edgy? You know what I mean? Do you feel that, like... You know where where comedy is today, where everything has to be very PC. Mm -hmm. um, do you feel that you would you would thrive in this climate today, where everyone's kind of on edge of what you know they don't know what to say? And it's that's another part of it too. I, I mean, my my comedy, you know, was always observational, in the sense of I I definitely had a a good set based on this great state of ours, right. and I would just riff on where I lived who I hung out with, uh, talk about the heat, talk about different parts of, of, of the state. And I made it so that for people who were comfortable in town that knew everything about jokes uh, from the weather to uh, desert landscaping to all that, that was where I, I, was, I was focused on. And then I got into music because when I was a kid, I used to sing a lot. And I just was, I loved the styles of some comedians that could play guitar, play piano, and sing along in their acts and everything. Right. My stuff was never edgy. My stuff was never controversial because I just, I, you, I like to be able to take it to a, a point where I can flip it and be more family oriented. So I've done a lot of family shows as well too. Nice. Um, but it is, it's tough now because, you know, I, I got to rewrite and re-jump in and figure out the younger crowd that's out there because it's, it's it, you know, you start talking. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, you know, I, you start talking about going to the roller rink on Friday nights at Rolero on yeah. the west side. They're just going to be like, what? 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 You it's actually did? Yeah. You see, the, the skating is coming back. It's now. getting there. Yeah. yeah so yeah. it's definitely a, a work in progress for me that I'm looking forward to to not only meet some new generation of comedy fans, but right. also uh, one of my heroes, Mark Cord is in town. He's, you know, done so many stuff for older people. Yeah. Uh, in his sets, you know, and he does fantastic work, you know, I mean, I'm at that balance now that I can, you know, pretty much share what I've done over the past and not have to worry about PC because I know how to turn it on and off. Yeah. And, uh, but it, it, it can be a little edgy because you see so many videos that are out there of, of hecklers and people just throwing stuff at people. That ain't the way it used to be. Right. So, 
you're there to have a good time and laugh. There's, you know, you shouldn't go to a comedy club to feel offended. You know, it's a comedy club, so. <laughs> With all the stand-up stuff I had been doing, uh, I was in a contest in, um, oh God, it was in Scottsdale called the Funniest Person in the Valley Contest in 2001. Okay. And uh, <laughs> I won the contest, but being, <laughs> I didn't get much time to celebrate because I won the contest in August of 2001. And then September 11th happened, so. Oh, wow. So um, through that, people had seen me in this contest and seen me, uh, at the improv because I had filtered in, but um, I had a couple uh, local people that had, had wanted me to be their pitch person for commercials here. And of course, one of them, uh, it, play, it still plays this day. People go, I just saw you on TV. I'm like, I haven't shot anything in quite some time, but it's, it's the Presto Auto Loan commercial. And um, I, I've been their pitch person for almost 10 years. Okay. And Rewinding a bit how I got into it, a lot of it was, was back with the days with uh, Louis Russo's class, and, and I went to uh, do a couple acting classes as well, too. So I got to, hooked up with a beautiful lady called, uh, her name was uh, Elaine Stein, and uh, this was back in the day where you go and do an acting class, and they would take a, a VHS copy and then shop it, yeah, shop it around to... Uh, What's to, VHS, Trav? Oh, uh, it's, this, it's this brick that's kind of like, you know, holding up your, uh, the back end of your chair right now. <laughs> but, yeah, they would take VHS copies and send them off to agents in town. And I got, I got hired by uh, Ford Robert Black almost 20 years ago. And through that, um, I went on auditions, pitch person, a pitch person for a bunch of uh, spots. But then I started getting some, some uh, regional, a couple nationals. I'm the only person that I think has been in two Super Bowl ads on the same game. And yeah, no one knows this. I was in a pure fitness commercial, as it worked out. I love it. And, um, and then a Ford F-150 commercial. And I was sitting at home and I knew that the, the pure fitness one was gonna air, but I didn't know the Ford one was gonna go. Right. So everyone in the house is going, oh my God, it's you. And then I go, yeah, within next commercial, boom, there I am again. And I'm like, oh my God. Now, of course, this is Arizona, you know, it's, you know, it's not, you know, you know, it's a right to work state. So, you know, I, everyone's like, how much you get paid for that? And I'm like, not much. Yeah. But I didn't mind the pay. It's just the, 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 the joy of the exposure of, of getting out there and, and being on TV and stuff. And as time went on, uh, I did a lot of great stuff with my friend Jill Kimmel that uh, we did a, a wonderful commercial for George Brazil where we got to work with Kurt Warner. Right. And he was a, he was a sweetheart. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I mean, th it, that's that's something I still do. But there and again, the generational side of it is is like I don't look that, you know, I don't look like the 34 year old guy that I was getting commercials back then. You know, now I look more like the 56 year old guy, and the commercials you see today, you know, or people, you know, you know, walking, you know, I, they're really young right. mixed people. I look like the guy like get off my lawn, you know. <laughs> Yeah. So, uh, I'm not going to get the Abercrombie and Fitch. No, no, no. <laughs> I'm going to get the, the Walmart one or, 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 or the one where the grandkids come over going, Happy birthday, right. Grandpa. And today's special. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's good, man. And then, so, and then with, with doing so, um, you were hosting a music show called Uncovered, I believe. Um, this was another period right after, oh, God, this was 2004. I was able to be a part of a group. Uh, on uh, uh, Channel 3, a dear friend of mine, Leanne Dolan, uh, uh, worked as a producer there, and the, <laughs> they had this station, and you guys remember the station because it became the CW, but it was like yeah. the, WB. the WB. So each station had like, you know, the, we, we had the WB6, yeah. and we all went out for a casting call where there was three guys, three girls. We all got together and got this part where we were like pitch person throughout the day like I would you know you would see us pop up and say you know come up again as home improvement followed by the Simpsons you know yeah. and as time went on uh, they were putting shows together uh, one of them was called give me the mic was which was like American Idol okay. uh, dear friend Brad Perry hosted that one but I was kind of his his open-up guy for the show and then they came back to do the show called uncovered 
and it was to find the best cover band in Arizona, which was kind of like making the band. And I got to host a round of people that were doing just cover songs. And one of them is, 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 is good old Jody. Yeah. And it was such a blast to do. Um, we did it in a small central location in downtown Phoenix and heard some of the greatest bands that did cover spots around town. And uh, well, we did more than that show. Like the WB6 got us to go off and do remotes. And, and, and yeah, that was another high point. But that uncovered show was a hoot it was it was it, I mean if you see video of it now I'm more like the old like Swingers uh bowling shirts if you remember back in the yeah. day you know the, the like the, the the velvet blue yeah uh, you know. so I had bad fashion sense back then so, you're so money baby yeah you're <laughs> dang money if you can remember like what was like one highlight moment from your time working on that show that you can recall? I'm sure there was plenty, but. I, you know, I definitely would say it would be with uh, Jody and Shining Light. Okay. I, I'm not. Shining Star. Shining Star. Yep, yep, yep. With Jody and Shining Star, I, 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 I just, their, their funkified portion of it was so cool. Um, the ensemble of it was more like an Earth, Wind & Fire uh, meets Sly and the Family Stone. They were funky, I liked about that. But also it was, all, it was, it was nice to be able to, have that MC spot to yeah. to be able to like, you know, here's this next band and here's that next band and all that stuff. And that got me a little bit more work is doing a lot of MC work. And yeah, I, I you know, when it comes to MCing, I, I have no problem doing that. So, but, but that, that was the highlight was definitely working with the bands and especially Shining Star. Uh, they were, they were funky. They were just so good, good, talented band, so. A lot of us that go th through life, we have that one artist that has been with us since we were young. Absolutely. Um, and I've been a Prince fan since I was 12. And why? It was just the, the stuff that I used to think that he could get away with. And my first album I purchased was 1999, and there was just some really sexual, suggestive songs on it. And I would go, can he say that on the radio, you know? Right. But as time went on, Purple Rain blew up. It became a fan for life. And in my 20s, um, I'd have to go to LA to go see him. Yeah. Because in this state, there was, it, was, it was so goofy back then. We had a governor that would not uh, approve of Martin Luther King Day. Right. And so Prince was like, uh-uh. You know, and other artists, the Public Enemy and all those guys, they were like, no, we're not playing there until you know, this gets resolved. And so he never really made it back here. So I'd have to go to uh, LA to go see his shows. Uh, and then he started showing up and, and just, it was just one of those where his energy, his, oh my God, it just, just, he's one of the best live performers ever. Ever, yeah. And then when 2016 hit, it was like a gut punch and a, and a, a man, it blew the wind out of me when he was gone because 2016 was also a hard year on music, you know, with David Bowie and George Michael. Yeah. All gone in one year, these three greats. Right. And I, I was in my mourning period, I guess you could say, and I was, uh, I was on Facebook and I found some people in Minneapolis that were celebrating his life. And I thought, you know, there's got to be some Prince people out here. There's got to be. And then sure enough, as I just started contacting people left and right, I ended up meeting a few people at events in 2016 uh, where there was like a spoken word uh, tribute to him, cover bands. This was at Crescent Ballroom. It was a beautiful night. And, uh, and I started meet, meeting people left and right. By that time, we were like going, well, let's just throw a Facebook group out there and see what happens. Right. And we're over, was it going on four, five years now? We were over 800 people that you didn't know were, were Prince fans here in town. And that's what it was. It's, it's, it's what gave me uh, an outlet to, to find new friends who had the same likes I did, just love the same music we did. I mean, if someone was to come to you and say, you know, hey man, I'm going to a party, I'm listening to nothing but Prince music, and we're like, okay. Right. You might have a different outcome on somebody else, but it, to me, it's like, you know, it's an all night party. Yeah. And that's how, you know, you and I connected and, and, and I got to connect with so many people that love his music. And you realize it's not about him, it's about just people getting together and having the same interest in loving great, great music. Absolutely. And so, you know, with that, we've done trips 
to Minneapolis together. We've done stuff in town together. And uh, it's, you know, it's, it's just nice to be able to share your passion with somebody else that has the same passion as you in that type of music. You know, we're not fanatics. We're just, you know, we just love the guy and we miss him. We want to celebrate his legacy as long as we can, Bug. And we want just want to be able to uh, celebrate everything there is about him. And, uh, and we have, a, we have a, a spousal group as well, too, because the spouses that are, they, they, we have a group that because are like, God, get away from Because <laughs> the spouses are just like going, will you just take your purple people and go that way? But no, it, it's, uh, it's a beautiful thing because it's not only here in Arizona. We've met people from California, Texas, all over the United States and the world. That share the same interests on that and we're just keeping his legacy alive that's the best that's what we love to do so yeah. when, I, when i went to i always used to go to glam slam in la right and that place oh you, uh, you could bump into a celebrity i remember one night that you know uh i i was second row and prince is on stage and he says you know stevie this is for you you're welcome to come get son and he starts to play curtains open up and stevie wonder walked out so i got to see that but uh, i mean but I, i've seen him here uh, I've seen him in LA. Last time I saw him perform live here was at the Marquee Theater in 2014. Uh, yeah, I, I mean. That was when he was with the female. Uh, uh, with Third Eye Girl. Yes, yeah. yes. And you know what's so crazy is that people were, myself included, and I, kick, I still kick myself in the ass to this day. People were saying that they, you know, people were like not wanting to go to the show because they said that he was just going to do like one or two records and his main focus was them, right? Right. right. So a lot of people just backed out and they're like, ah, oh, nah, man, it's not a Prince show. Yeah. He ended up doing like an hour and a half set. Right. And a lot of people were also about the, the fact of how much it cost. It yeah. was 300 a show, but you have... For something that's not, yeah. Right. You have to imagine, though, that this is 2014. Look at how much ticket prices are th these days. Yeah. And, and it's in a smaller venue, not so much as being downtown or at, 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 at State Farm. Uh, you know, he made it to a small, intimate area of just, you know, good fans. So people shied away from uh, the price tag, especially. But the other thing was uh, he was supposed to do two shows a night. People were, didn't buy enough tickets. So he's like, OK, well, I'll just do one show a night. Yeah. So we got the best, you know, on, on two shows. But yeah, that was the last time I saw him was uh, in at the Marquee Theater. So. What was he like live, man? Like, yeah. you know what I mean? Like, what's what's one of the best shows out of the 12? What's one of the best ones that you can recall that he just did something at that night that just, just really spoke to you? Well, I'm not here to toot my horn, but I did go to the Super Bowl. Uh, I Wait, No. Yes. My I, now, now, my side job that I used to do, I still do now, you know, who I, who I was with before, I used to sell a lot of Coors Light, and I won this contest. This is back when Coors Light own the rights to the Super Bowl. And I got sent to Miami to go see it. And I remember I'm a, my wife and I are big Bears fans. And I told my wife, I'm going to the Super Bowl. She goes, we're going to see the Bears. I'm like, no, I'm going to see Prince. And, and I was out of this world. Now I was really far back, but still I got to experience the rain. So the I was in the building. I'll wow. even send you photos too. I was in the building and, uh, Beautiful. Everyone's said that's one of his biggest performances. But I'm going to say probably my, my biggest favorite show was 2004. He performed at, uh, oh gosh, uh, it's now Desert Diamond, I think it was. Yeah, Gila River. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He performed out there, and it was, uh, it was right after my son was born. And <laughs> my wife was sitting in the front row. She had just had a C-section. And uh, I knew this part was coming up. And this was during musicology, and I knew this part was coming up. He finished a song, yeah. and he said, Candy. He goes, let me get some people on stage. And I ran to the side, and I'm like, me! <laughs> yeah. I got whipped up on stage, and I just kind of took a, took a beat going, boy, imagine performing in front of these people and doing some stand-up. But I turned around, I'm on stage, and the, the stage got flooded with a lot of people. Uh, I could see his drummer, John Blackwell, Renato Neto, his keyboardist, and... Uh, we all just had a, uh, a dance party to where I was, yeah. I was doing Raspberry Beret and Take Me With You on stage. And within probably the end of the set, all of a sudden, he comes walking this way. And I just went, oh, this is going to be terrible if it doesn't happen. So I just kind of went like that. And he hit me right here. So I know exactly where he hit me. But yeah, wow. 
so that's my that's my all-time favorite concert of his so but uh people always say like you have a problem I'm like no i just i'm just this guy's just a genius yeah man, he's a no. genius i mean you yeah. you you walk in a store some somewhere and you hear Dar darling nikki come on you will sing in the middle of target you know a new right. girl named nikki. you wouldn't yeah it's just yeah it's just it's yeah like i've never been i've never been cool with people that 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 get, you know, they feel that people are like overly dramatic over entertainers or singers or artists when they pass away. They're like, you didn't even know them. Da, da, da. I don't have to. Yeah. Their music spoke to me. Their music may have helped Absolutely. me in a dark, dark time. It, it takes me back to good memories. Mm -hmm. um, that's what they do it for. Yeah. So it missed me with all that BS, oh, you know yeah. what I mean? Like, Absolutely. Yeah. And it's, it's, you know, it's, you have to have people now to realize What's going to happen when Taylor Swift pa passes away? What's going to happen when, you know, that's going to be a major thing. You're going to remember that time going, oh, I remember when I went and saw her. That's the same thing with us, you know. If the man was still around, we would still probably have a little small group, but we'd go see him. Right. But then you have that woulda, coulda, shoulda of all these little one-night uh, piano and a microphone shows that he was just him on his on his piano. Yeah, yeah I mean, we, we, the, one of the best quotes I have, I've thought seen out there was the world's been around for about three billion years aren't you lucky to be alive during when prince was alive it's just my kindness you know I, I i'm definitely a guy who you know likes to make sure everyone's kind of taken care of and and you know, so much that's happened in the world over the past year and, 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 and the losses I've had. You know, I just want to be remembered for the, the kindness and fun times I've been with people. And, and definitely, if I could bring a laugh to someone. Uh, you, you know, if someone remembers uh, some jokes, you know, I, I'll still get somebody that'll call me up on the phone and I'm like, dude, I just remember that joke you told that one time. And I'll be like, yeah. And uh, I want to be able to, you know, make sure they remember that everything I was doing was out of kindness and out of love and just, you know, I loved performing for someone to make sure that I got their, I got their day in a better place than it was before, maybe. Um, but also, you know, my, my family especially, you know, they've gotten me through the dark times and gotten me, gotten me to here and they're the best friends I've ever had in the entire world. And uh, um, more, more than that, it's just, you know, knowing that I've had such a good run with uh, making people laugh, and and I'm looking forward to doing. I'm looking forward to doing more of that down the road. But I'm definitely that type of person now that like you know what I got to do a show. There's something on Netflix right now. You know, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. it happens. Life happens when it grabs you and wants to settle you down a little bit, and it changes your aspect. If you know if you want to be a performer, you got to you got to change things up. You got to keep writing. You got to keep creating. You got to keep uh, true to yourself. And that's why I'm going to make sure before I hit the stage again, that's what I want to do. But I definitely want to make sure that, you know, if I leave, if I leave this, this place, I want someone to at least have a smile on their face that knew, you know, remember that time? Yeah. yeah. So <laughs> my eulogy, there you go. It, it gets me out of bed every day. Uh, keeps me going. It keeps me. It keeps me. It, it keeps me making sure I get to go say hi to people. I mean, I mean, I feel overjoyed to have so many people I've worked with, made laugh, comedians, actors, agencies, uh, and I'm also blessed with the people that I've come across now, with you know, loving Prince, music, the community. And stuff like you're doing, Dave, it's just the positivity you have to keep giving to people out there is, is all we have to, is, is what we have right now. You know, we were in really dark times a couple years back and not knowing where we were going and we still are on a bumpy road to get out of there. But, uh, you know, I, I feel very, very humbled to know that I'm loved out there, especially by my family and my friends. 
and I'm just just happy. This is something I've always wanted to do. I've always wanted to have some, you know, like it's like the MTV behind the music thing, you know. And, and Dave came to me, and I'm like, I, I'm I'm totally jazzed. I'm doing this, but never thought I would get to a point where I'm doing like a retrospect of all the stuff I've done over the years. But that's what makes me feel special is that you are here interviewing me about some cool stuff that I totally even forgot back in the day. Uh, but and also the state. Love this state. I can make fun of you, but I know you're going to hit me with 114 degree weather and you're going to make up for it. So, yeah, I'm just I'm just glad to be here. Thanks again for watching. My name is Travis Thurman. That's my five. And keep supporting Dave Miranda. He's just fantastic at what he's doing. And uh, yes, thank you again for, you know, taking the time to watch this. So appreciate it. And there you have it. Man, shout out to my brother Travis, man. You know, I, I am a diehard Prince fan. You see the tattoo, you know what time it is. And uh, I got to shout out my homegirl Lori because Lori is a diehard Prince fan just like myself. And uh, she's actually the one who um, invited me out to a uh, Purple Paisies of AZ event um, back in uh, 2019 at Film Bar. And uh, they were showing Under the Cherry Moon. They were, they were playing the movie and um, you know, I was able to meet everybody, you know, it was just, and it was just like this awesome, you know, just this, this awesome, just, this vibe, man. You know, you got just an, an abundance of everybody that's on the same page. Everybody's, you know, everybody shares their same likings of Prince and you can just kind of nerd out, you know what I'm saying? And uh, Travis was just, from the moment I met him, just so, you know, welcoming, down to earth, just a very, very good hearted individual. And, uh, you know, somebody I am proud to call a friend and uh, man, my brother, I wish you nothing but the best and nothing less. Thank you so much for being a part of this platform. All right. Make sure you guys are following him on social media. And shout out to my brother, Jimmy Nelson, on the camera. Make sure you guys subscribe to that YouTube channel. Tell a friend to tell a friend. All right. Well, this was definitely one for the books. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did, though. Until next time, stay tuned, stay blessed, stay healthy, and just give me five, y'all. Everything you get, you got the world.